Eat up, I, you can scratch all night with a coin on your Tonight Show ticket. You're not going to win anything. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you have been playing the lottery? <laughs> all of the money, as you know, goes for education. So uh, someday our kids will be smart enough not to play the lottery. <laughs> Another Friday, I'm looking forward to another exciting weekend. Floods after the fire. <laughs> they finally... How many of you came out here on a vacation this time of year to California? <laughs> Happy to report, they apparently have got all the brush fires in Southern California under control because they had a great team. They, had, they brought in the same team that put out the Freddy Corpus' uh, birthday cake uh, can, candle. <laughs> Was that again? I don't know what it was. I, I wasn't paying any attention. But you make up your own, fill in the blanks, make up a joke, and pass it on. <laughs> Malibu, though, is a convenient place to live. Your your barbecue starts without you in the backyard, which is kind of... <laughs> well, in his first official move today in baseball, Richard Nixon got Gerald Ford to pardon Billy Martin. <laughs> the Dodgers, as you know lost and uh, <clears throat> Tommy Lasorda is still despondent over the loss today he tried to jump off one of his hero sandwiches <laughs> there's not a great deal in the news uh, today um, one kind of important item this weekend marks the anniversary of the invention of the incandescent lamp by Thomas Edison in Menlo Park New Jersey now, this, this may not mean much to you, but before that time, moths never had a place to gather socially. <laughs> and one of the... One of the big drawbacks... One of the big drawbacks to Edison's invention of the light bulb was that for the first time, people could see what Menlo Park looked like at night. <laughs> What else is happening? Do you know our Attorney General, Ed Meese, the winner of the Ed McMahon Lookalike Contest, incidentally, <laughs> is in hot water again? Yeah. Because he reportedly said, it, the Attorney General said, he disagrees with the constitutional guarantee that you're innocent until proven guilty. Hmm. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> of course, under heavy questioning, Meese admitted he didn't really read the Constitution. He read the classic oh. comic book version. <laughs> You know, I worry about an attorney general who bones up on the law by watching Perry Mason reruns on cable. <laughs> how many of you, speaking of Jackie Gleason, how many of you have been watching the Lost Honeymooner episodes? <laughs> I recently found some lost footage from the only film I ever made. And you know oh, what it is. Yes. Looking L for Looking love. for love with Connie How did Prince. you find it? Well, I found it. <laughs> and I... Uh, <laughs> I found that lost film, and I got a <laughs> I got a grant from the Motion Picture Academy to lose it again. It was a bad picture. <laughs> anyway, Jackie Gleason is the only man in the world who makes Ed McMahon look like a Boy Scout. <laughs> I kid you about yours. Remember the Cramlin's apartment? How many of you know the street it was on? Trivia. Chauncey Street? Tiny cold water flight on Chauncey Street? The building went condo. <laughs> An apartment recently sold for $250,000. <laughs> Bring it up today. Along with Mr. Gleason tonight, we have Mr. Jim Stafford. Yeah. And... And Doc is going to auction off his red shoes. And we have actress Rita Wilson tonight. So stay where you are, and we'll be here. We handed out a few cards here to see what kind of a mood you're in. They're strange, crazy mood. strange questions you get. You don't have to call out where you're sitting in case you're with somebody you're not supposed to be with, but... <laughs> Tony... Is it Tony? Stewart? Tony? He's with someone he's not supposed to is be with. Is that a man or a woman? Oh, oh, I see. Yes, it is. 
Would you entertain, consider, would you consider, oh, come on, having an affair with a 20-year-old, 24-year-old woman? Are you 24, Tony? Oh, now, come on, 24 years old. I'm old enough to be the guy who will drive you out to Malibu. <laughs> Willie W-I-P-F-F? Whiff. Th- Whiff. Willie Whiff. <laughs> I like that. Willie Whiff. I like that. You ought to be in show business and starving Willie Whiff. <laughs> Is it W-I-P-F-F, Willie? That's it. Where are you from, Willie? Uh, San Francisco. Yeah. Willie Whiff. Nice. Top. Excuse me? Been pals. I don't know. <laughs> well, look at the question. Can I borrow five thousand dollars so I can go to school next year? <laughs> no, you can't, Willie. <laughs> Where do you want to go to school, Willie? Ah, uh, five thousand. Is that what a tuition is now? <laughs> Housing. <laughs> uh, Larry Buell. Yo. <laughs> you know what? This sounds like a roll call in the service. <laughs> Who was your biggest influence when you were growing up? Uh, Albert Einstein? Zorro? <laughs> Nancy Polenza? <laughs> Can I photograph you in the nude? <laughs> no, no, Nancy, you'll have to wear a robe. I can't. <laughs> Frank Para? Is that right, pa- Frank? All right. How were you ever lucky enough to find someone from the state of Oregon? Did I pronounce it right, Oregon? No. I did. Oregon. Oregon. To be your band leader. That doc is from Oregon. That's what he's talking about, right? Well, I guess we were. Our first choice, uh, Freddie the Salmon. Remember, died. You know? <laughs> Whereabouts in Oregon? Well, originally Arlington, Oregon, population 601. Now it's only 600. <laughs> Jim Mona? Yeah. How are you, Jim? Good. Is that right? M O N A? That's right. Where are you from, Jim? Little Falls, Minnesota. Uh huh. <laughs> what is your idea of a perfect woman? Sensitive, intelligent, tolerant, tolerant, tolerant. tolerant. <laughs> caring, forgiving. Yes, yep. with jambalayas out to Glendale. <laughs> <laughs> caring, yes. Are these all written by the same person? Would you like to? I can't read that. You got your glasses on? Yep. I'm going to start getting reading glasses. It's very small. Well, you're getting some nice offers tonight. <laughs> would you like to go out to dinner with three lovely ladies from Allentown, Pennsylvania, please? Wait a minute. Is this, would you like to go out to dinner with three young... Uh, this is all the same people. Well, this is lady number one, Jean Triani, is it? Yes. Would you Triani? like to be escorted to dinner by three lovely ladies from Allentown, Pennsylvania? It's got all three of them. Yeah. What is this? What are your ladies' names? Karen, Rita? Ritter. Ritter. And Yvonne. And Jean. And Jean. Malentown. Well, that's very nice. We go Dutch? <laughs> sure. Beg your pardon? Jeffrey Getz or Gertz? Yeah. Jeffrey's a very large group. <laughs> Is it safe to eat across the street at Los, Los Arcos Mexican restaurant? <laughs> Freddie's going easy, easy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's safe. Of course it's safe to eat at Los Arcos. Yeah. As long as you order a side order of priest, maybe not. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a nice restaurant. That's not true. No, it's a good friendly. restaurant. They're nice people. Because they could, they could sue us for yeah, something very like friendly. That. 
I'll tell you, they do have speed bumps on the way to the men's room, though. <laughs> It's a nice place. <laughs> I can't read the name. But would you would you like to work with me at the post office? What's what's the name here? Is it Blanche? That's it, Blanche. Yeah, this is dated 1963. <laughs> Just joking. Blanche. Tom Johnson. Where are you, Tom? I saw your house while on a tour today. When is the last time you saw it? <laughs> See, I, I saw it on a tour yesterday. It looks nice. Yeah, they're, they're keeping it up well. Uh, Jerry Carney from uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Why do you drive yourself to work and Ed has someone drive him? That's interesting. I, well, it has to be driven to work. You don't like to drive. No, no. it doesn't really. He doesn't like to drive. No, and I, I like to drive. It's all sure. Don't you ever drive? Once in a while, on the weekends, occasionally. Yes, I do recreational driving. Uh huh. <laughs> Another question about you. Do you have any influence on whether or not Ed McMahon's contract is renewed? What contract? I bought, you have a handshake. I bought Ed at a Marine PX in 19, uh, 1957. Right. No, that's not Lori DiGiulio. Where are you, Lori? Right here. Is that your, is that your helicopter <laughs> in the back parking lot? No, no. I think that's the... That must be the NBC News, News. helicopter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And occasionally used to stir Ed's margaritas. That's right. <laughs> And does a wonderful job. Tom Hahoxie. You frequently mention a oh, hermit named Dave, and Ed always panics. Why? Well, that's an old limerick. Why don't you tell him a limerick? I can't Why'd tell you. Tell him. No, it's an no, old certain, it's, As far as you can go. Just no. go as far as you can go. No, I can't. All good limericks are a little bit... Uh, Raunchy. Raunchy, yeah. And it started off, there was an old hermit named Dave. Yeah. And the rest of it, I can't even tell you. <laughs> Lady from Wheeling? No, come on, no, don't start that. <laughs> we will take a break. In just a moment, Jackie Gleason will be out here, so stay where you are. Thank you, Doc. We are back. Okay. What can you say? My first guest tonight does not need a very effusive introduction, but I'd like to give him one anyway because I am an unabashed fan of Jackie Gleason. Ever since I saw him in the early days of television back in the early 50s when he was doing the Cavalcade of Stars out of New York, he's the subject of a book written by a columnist and a pal of his for 36 years, Jim Bacon, called How Sweet It Is. Uh, he has worked in practically every branch uh, of our business, including uh, nightclubs and motion pictures and television. And he is one of the true comic geniuses uh, of our times. Would you welcome Mr. Jackie Gleason? Just once say how sweet it is, and we'll get on with this. How sweet it is! <laughs> you know, you know, must be a kick. You did the Honeymooners in the, what year exactly? The, the first uh, original 39 episodes. I think around uh, 1951. 51. We started them. Only did 39 episodes. 39. Of the half hours. And now you have a whole new generation of fans, the youngsters, of course, who were just born and are now seeing them all over. It must give you a great kick. 
It is. To see a whole new generation. Very gratifying to think that something you did 30 years ago shows up and is a hit. Yeah, and a big hit. Yeah. And a big, big hit. You know, this this is the first time. I've been doing this show for 23 years. Never had you on the show. I don't understand it, John. Yeah. <laughs> the, only, the only thing I can figure is I, I was waiting to find out if this show was a hit. <laughs> You're out here doing a picture with, uh, with young Tom Hanks, right? Yes, yeah. and he is a fine actor. Yeah. Great actor. Now, tell me about your friend Bacon here. You've known each other for a number of years, and you both... Uh, the book is filled with a lot of your... Uh, uh, for the lack of a better word, pranks or uh, escapades. escapades, evenings out. Um, matter of fact, you, you kind of wrote this uh, book over uh, sharing a little little scotch at one time. Well, we, we had a few appetifs. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Jim is a good man with the yes, scene. He so he's very nice company. Matter, of fact, matter we, of fact, when you were doing the toy, didn't they tell him to... Uh, Oh, they considered him a bad companion for me. (laughs) They thought if he showed up, I'd get stewed. (laughs) And they were right. You know, I I was reading the book last night, and uh, I came into your dressing room a while just before the show tonight. And I said, you remember a show. Oh, John. We can get that one out of the way right off. Uh, Yeah. You've had many successes, but you did a television show in 1961. The show itself went on one time. It was called Your in the picture. Oh. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up yes. was because I was also a part of the show. You were the host, if I remember, and you sat over to the right of the stage and you sat at a little table and you had your little coffee cup. And they, I think I was on the show, I think Arthur Treacher. Arthur Treacher. The late Milt Kamen. Jan Sterling. Now, the idea of the show was they had the television audience could see at home and the studio audience could see a picture. The celebrities would come, and we put our heads through a hole in the picture from the back. We didn't know what the picture was. Good God. Yeah. I was one of those people. And uh, you would ask questions, and we would ask questions of you, what we were doing. Are we an animal and so forth? And it really did not go too well. And I remember one of the questions I asked you about halfway through. I said... Would you tell me why I've got my head through this hole in this picture? <laughs> the critics took the show apart, and next week you came on the stage and did one of the funniest half hours on television because you didn't do that show. You just sat, sat down and apologized. I came out and apologized to the audience for committing such a terrible crime. This was the biggest bomb ever put on television. <laughs> And when I went to the executives of CBS and I said, uh, I got to go on next week and apologize for this. They said, we don't allow anybody to go on and apologize for anything we put on. And I said, well, this week you're going to. And um, I had a lot of fun that, that oh, night. It was, a, it was wonderful. You came out and sat there. It was one of the funniest half hours I've ever seen. You only did, we talk, let's talk about the honeymoon a little bit. You did 39 and they came to you and wanted you to do an, another season. Yeah. And you said no at the time. Uh, they didn't want, believe people have me. always wondered why you didn't, because it's so successful. Well, we were running out of ideas, and uh, I like the honeymoons. I like doing them. And I didn't want to denigrate them by, you know, forcing scenes that didn't mean anything. Right. So I wanted to quit. And they didn't be- believe me. They thought I had another job someplace. Right. But I didn't, and I'm glad I did stop then, because what we had done was good. And if we had gone any further, we might have spoiled it. Yeah. All these characters, I saw the piece that Morley Saver did with you on 60 Minutes. All the characters you do, from Ralph Cramden to Joe the bartender to the poor soul, really came out of your background in the early years in Brooklyn, didn't they? Well, yes. uh, The honeymooners especially, because there were a thousand Nortons and a thousand Cramdons. And uh, Reggie, of course, uh, I did in burlesque. And I did The Poor Soul in, on Broadway. Right. So they, they fit in pretty good with television. Which of those characters, of all of them, uh, is the closest to Jackie Gleason? Well, you, I, can you most identify with? I guess I'd have to say Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had the train set up where the train came out with a little jigger of booze. We're going to take a short break. We're coming right back. <laughs> That's the one I used to put me
the event. Okay. You're a great man. You used to play the trumpet. In your no, act, but I, I played that. Played at it. Yeah. In your early act. Yes. <laughs> you played a lot of what was on I the had the worst act John, <laughs> in show business. It was horrible. And uh, it was six minutes of absolute boredom. And on our show one night, the curtain got stuck. So I said, I am going to do my old act. And it was a riot. It killed them. <laughs> killed the people. Can't understand it. When I needed it, it didn't work. Didn't you work at it? Was it Jack White's? Uh, Jack Club? White's 18 Club. 18 Club? Greatest nightclub in the world. Was that one of your early jobs? Yeah. Uh, you weren't allowed to do an act. You, it was all ad lib. And every night there were big stars, Robert Taylor, Jimmy Cagney, and they'd come in and we'd make fun of them. And uh, it was a hot spot. All the columnists came in every uh, night. It was a joy working there. Didn't you used to hustle pool after you got out of high school? Yes. Well, no, when I was in grammar school. I oh, did. grammar school. <laughs> I started out as a rack boy when I was about nine years old. And they let me play in the back table. And I got pretty good at it. And when somebody came in and wanted to play somebody, they picked me. Right. I was the house boy. And then on graduation day in grammar school, you know, they gave you those little gold pens. Yeah. And I used to play the kids for their gold pens. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd get a nice box of them and go down to the hot shop and turn them in. <laughs> so, so this came up when you did The Hustler, in which you were nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah. That came in handy, shooting pools. Oh, yes, sure Minnesota fans. Sure it did. And Paul began to learn to play pool very well. Yeah. You got Willie Moscone, somebody said, to kind yeah, of give him some lessons. he's the greatest. Did you do in grammar school Little Red Riding Hood in a Yiddish accent? Is that true? You certainly have done your research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. And uh, that's when I knew, well, I knew I wanted to be in show business before then. Uh, my father took me to a vaudeville show. And at intermission, they put the house lights on. And I was sitting in the first row. And I stood up and I turned around and I faced the audience. And I knew that that's the way I should look for the rest of my life. And uh, then the next thing was the school play. Right. And I got a couple of laughs and that did it. That always does, doesn't it, for, for oh, comedians? Yeah. There is nothing like a big yammo coming in. <laughs> <laughs> a big yuck. <laughs> a lot of the book is devoted to uh, your old friend, uh, whom I know, of course, not as well as you, Toot Shore. And his, uh, his saloon, Toots would never call it a restaurant, it was a saloon, he was a saloon keeper, right? <laughs> he sure was. Um, <laughs> and you, when, when Toots died, I, I read that you sent a, a wreath that said, uh, save me a table. Yeah. Is that right? Were the, were the bouts, uh, the drinking bouts as, as large? Did you ever miss a performance because of it? No, never did. Never missed a show. And uh, I'm not advocating that everybody should drink. Right. It just worked for me. <laughs> Of course, the gentleman on my right has had a taste or two. Yes, he was. <laughs> I was reading in the book, when you, when, you, when you do the shows, you were one of those people who've got an instinctive ability to look at a piece of material, a script, and then go out and, and do it. You didn't particularly like rehearsing. No, I hated to rehearse. And I had a stand-in who was funnier than I was. He would do the sketches with the performers. I'd go through it with them once, and then he would do it. Uh, I just didn't like to rehearse. I thought it took something away from the performance. But there were some wonderful moments on the show where things would happen. In fact, they oh. played some of those recently with the, with the old uh, the Lost episodes. Connie, one time, was trying to get out the door, and it was stuck, so we went out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Reasonable. Right. Yeah. Went down the fire escape and came back up. <laughs> He's good. Connie is one of the greatest comedians of, and dramatic actors of all times. Yeah, he is. Uh... <laughs> and Aud Audrey Meadows, Ooh. sensational. You originally turned Audrey down, didn't you? She came in and auditioned for the part, if I remember, looking very pretty, and you said, no, she's too pretty for the part, and then somebody gave you a picture where she kind of... Uh... Well, that's the legend. I'll go yeah. along with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. But you're a, you like to act, don't you? You're, you're a good actor. You have a lot of depth as an actor. As, well, as a I serious like an actor. 
uh, I think that comedians, it's a strange thing. Uh, many comedians have become good actors, but I don't know of any good actors who became great comedians. That's true. Absolutely true. Let's talk about money a little bit. Twitch used to tell me that. Yeah. But, no. <laughs> Twitch used to tell me before you made it big, you used to run up tabs at his place and, and, and hand out tips even when you didn't have it. Well, uh, he said to me, he said, if you want anything, go ahead and sign for it. So I said, all right. So I signed a tab one night, it was for about $60, and I put a $40 tip. <laughs> <laughs> and he came flying over. <laughs> He says, what are you doing? I said, keep this up and I'll give you back your pen. <laughs> so you just signed the tabs? Oh, yes. All right, sign. We're going to take a break. We're going to be right back. <laughs> there we go. We're back. We're talking to Jackie Gleason. Was it in the 60s, Jack, you made the uh, the albums, Music for Lovers Only, and some of those other great mood albums? Yes. That's uh, an interesting no, story. No, it started around, I think, 54. That's an interesting story. This is something you wanted to do, and everybody wouldn't back you on it and said, you got to be kidding, because uh, you, you, have, you don't read music. Uh, that's right. And you don't write it, and yet you came out with these albums and conducted, and they were a smash hit. Well, it all happened because of Clark Gable. I saw Gable in a picture, and he was all made up, and he was dressed in tails. Looked great. Uh, and he was doing the dialogue. Then he sat down on the couch with the girl, and the music snuck in. And then everything he said was just magnified a thousand percent. So I figured, if Gable needed music, a guy in Brooklyn must be desperate. <laughs> so... <laughs> we put together the music, and as it turned out, it was quite successful. Yeah, you had strings. You got uh, uh, Bobby Hackett. Oh, yeah. One of the great trumpet players. Only The only trumpet Funny player. Funny thing, when, when I first heard uh, Bobby, he was playing guitar in Glenn Miller's orchestra. And every now and then, they'd let him play a sweet passage. So I heard him do this, and I said, someday I'll get some strings, an acre of strings, and you'll play the, the horn, and we'll make some music. Didn't you have 40 mandolin players? Or something oh, like that? Oh, that was the what was time that? of all times. Forty mandolin players. You couldn't get a haircut for 50 miles around. No chance. And they came in and sat down, and they started to play, and they had hard picks. And it sounded like somebody threw a bed spring out the window. So I said, Dad, this will never do. I said, and I sent out for soft picks. And they played it, and it still was a little raunchy. So I went around with a glass of water, and I said, dip your picks in the water, soften them up. Now they start to play, and the water's hitting them in the chin. <laughs> and they're ready to go, you know, they think I'm a nut. So we finally made a recording, and I played it back to them, and they were all very satisfied. But that was a tough session. Yeah, you also sat down and been... And did the, uh, the theme song for you, the uh, Melancholy, Melancholy, Melancholy Serenade, Serenade, didn't you? Know. you? And uh, our friend there was very kind to play it one night. Yeah. yeah played a whole right. medley. I remember you sent me a note on that. Yes, Forgotten, yes. yes. Was very nice. Who influenced you? Who did you enjoy as a kid watching? I know Ollie and uh, Stan and Ollie were... Oh. You and Art did him one night. Uh, and it was Jack Oakey. Jack Oakey. Jack Oakey was one of the best comedians and dramatic actors I had ever seen on the screen. Uh, he always played... John Payne's right. friend, but he made it interesting, <laughs> and that's not easy to do. Why don't you? See, why don't you see? <laughs> why don't you see my, many sketch comedians anymore? Pardon me, John. Sure, certainly. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> that's good coffee. Oh, that's good coffee. Oh, that's dandy. <laughs> You don't see many sketch comedians anymore. Everybody's doing no, stand-up. No, there's very few. You don't see the real physical uh, type of uh, sketches anymore. I wonder why. Uh, I think it's because of programs that use monologists. Yeah. And all they have to do is walk out and tell some jokes. And uh, they're stuck with that. They never do scenes. Right. Uh, there's very few places. There's no more burlesque or anything where you, or variety shows right. where you do scenes. 
So I guess that's why there aren't good scene comics around. Yeah, it's too bad. There are some. Yeah. Who who do you watch? Do you watch much television at all? I watch uh, the uh, Channel 2, is it, here? Is that the, the uh, public... Uh, must be Channel 6 or Channel 28, I don't know. One and I watch sporting events. Uh, because when I watch a situation comedy show... Uh, they do the first few lines, and I know where it's going, so it's no fun. And then they have the laugh machine. Yeah. Guy comes in and says, hello, and gets a yuck. <laughs> Hi, Dad. How's the job? Oh! <laughs> I remember. Guy sits there playing the organ. I remember when you did the, uh, it was the Ducana cam system, they call it, Dumont, uh, with the yes. three cameras set up, the first time done, all in front of a live audience. That's right. In you New never York. did a show any other way but in front of an audience. No cue cards, no teleprompters, and uh, that's the only way to do a show. Yeah. How are you going to know if you're timing something if you haven't anyone to say it to? Yeah, get that feedback. Yeah. Anything in your life that you want to do you haven't done yet? No, I've been pretty lucky. I got a chance to do most everything I wanted to do. Uh, some of it laid a bomb. Some of it was pretty good. Uh, I've been very, very lucky. And anybody that thinks it's just their talent, uh, they're crazy. You've got to have luck. And, you know, talent, talent is a very annoying thing because you can't take any credit for it. It's a gift from God, you know, and you're stuck with that. <laughs> Somebody says you're good, you say, well, God did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your case... <laughs> Look, I, I, can you stay with us the rest of the show? Do you want you have to split? I know I you're, to, you're, you got to go, go because I know you're doing this picture called uh, I forgot the name of the picture. Nothing in Common. Nothing in Common with Tom Hanks. I can't tell you what a kick it is to finally have come out here and spend a little time together. John, you were beautiful. I've been an admirer of you. Yes, held up the book. <laughs> yeah, Jim's Jim's book house. Uh, what's the name? What's it called? Oh, sweet, sweet it, it is. is. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Remarkable. Ooh, he's remarkable. You know, I've said this before, and I didn't say it when he was out here, but that gentleman has never been, has never received an Emmy, if That's you can terrible. believe it, from the Television matter. Academy in this business, and the Academy ought to be towed about 20 miles out to sea and dropped in the ocean. Yeah. Something is wrong somewhere. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. He's a very bright, funny entertainer. He's a songwriter, a raconteur, and he's hosted several national television shows. Would you welcome Mr. Jim Stafford? Jim. Thank you, folks. I sure appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'd like to play a song for you on this guitar, but first I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. This is a U.S. Army M16 assault guitar, <laughs> and it's going to be used in the new Sylvester Stallone movie, Mambo. Now, it plays like a regular guitar see, but it's run through a synthesizer that makes it sound like anything but a guitar. I'll show you what I mean. This is uh, a dueling duck calls. <laughs> and, you, and you can strum a pipe organ like this. Magician. We didn't see what happened when you were uh, doing the uh, the pipe organ thing. The guys in the brass section were breaking their horns. <laughs> you can do anything now with a synthesizer. The M16 guitar. Now, I bought that at a music store for about $2,600, and you can order one direct from the Pentagon for about $700,000. <laughs> That's weird. I've never heard anything like that. They, you can do anything Pretty now. wild, yeah. I yeah. haven't seen you for a while. What have you been up to? Well, um, I, uh, I did a game show pilot. Did a game show pilot. Yeah. Chance for Romance. 
Are you putting me on now? No. I never no. know with you. Chance for romance. Uh, yeah, yeah. My uh, agent called me and said, uh, said we got a game show for you. And I said, well, I'm a performer. I don't, uh, I don't host game shows. And I wouldn't consider that until I had exhausted all possibilities. Yeah. My manager said, well, you better come over. <laughs> come on over. Manager's honest, huh? Yes. So I went over, and, uh, and this is the truth. They had offices set up on Ventura Boulevard for this production company. It's an NBC show. Uh-huh. Uh, and the offices were over a liquor store on Ventura Boulevard beside an ugly duckling rent a car. Mm-hmm. And they had cars on, bo- on, on blocks in the parking lot. And so I went over there and I saw the run-throughs and met some of the contestants that, that you get on these kinds of shows, the chance for romance. I guess they put an ad in the paper, don't they, and say you want to be on a TV show? Yeah, and they're, I think they're looking mostly for uh, weirdos. Uh-huh. It seemed to me to be that way. We had a fellow there whose hobby was trying to sneeze with his eyes open. We had a girl there who wanted to, her life's ambition was to visit all the planets. <laughs> I think she had relatives that she wanted to see. And we had a guy there who, who took a hand puppet around with him on his first dates to break the ice. Just I don't think he dated average much. people, huh? No, I don't think he dated much, but he always had his, his hand puppet, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh... Some folks, let yeah. me tell you. So they had that kind of thing. And you had uh, guys competing for dates with girls and their chance uh, for romance. And you know, a funny thing happened. The executives from the, in, the, you know, after you do a few weeks of run throughs, then the NBC brass comes over to see how you're doing. Right. So this one guy pulls up in the parking lot. He parks between a Dipsy dumpster and a Chevy Nova with a missing engine. Right. We didn't get nothing out of him. He sat by the window all day watching his car. Right. <laughs> then the other guy, yeah, there was a second in, uh, executive showed up. He got the address right, but he didn't know we were upstairs. He went in the liquor, liquor store. store. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think he liked the show because when I saw him, he, he seemed to like everything. He are just, we, uh, are we going to see the show on the air, possibly? No. Chance for Romance didn't make no, it. No, uh, Chance for Romance uh, didn't, uh, didn't oh. make it, but that's all right. Yeah. I uh, I did a movie. That's what I hear. Yeah, I made a movie. I made a movie, not an expensive movie. Some <laughs> independent financiers got together and held a car wash. <laughs> <laughs> we made uh, a movie called Kid Coulter. Kid Coulter. Made it for a million dollars. That's what I, nowadays. That's but it has the look of a two million dollar movie. I like that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's, as long as you put the money up there on the screen. Oh, it's yeah. all up there. Right. And it'll be out when they get the poster right. <laughs> They, they, they didn't get the poster right, and they got a new, they, uh, maybe that wasn't in the budget, but they got it. A guy called me a couple of days ago, and he said, uh, we got the poster right, and it'll be out wow. in Seattle and somewhere in Texas in two weeks. Wow. <laughs> You're covering a lot of ground. Well, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, that, that happened. And Quick. While I was on the set, uh, I learned how to make a sound. A sound? Yeah, do I have time or yeah, if real, I don't have time? Yeah, real, real quick here. Real quick. Yeah, you, know how, you know how people make weird sounds? Yeah. I learned one. This is 